Start recording now. Okay. All right, now what are you going to do? Uh, it's a pleasure. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Wednesday, March 10th, 2010, and this is conversations.net and thefutureofeducation.com. And we're sure glad to have you here tonight. Special guests Gordon Bell and Jim Gemmel. Is that right, Jim? That's right. Nice to have you here, both of you. Thanks for being on the show. Delighted to be okay. here. Okay, so Gordon, you're not seeing it, but I have a picture of you and Jim up and then a little picture of the cover of the book. The event series is sponsored by Learn Central. They're my uh, daytime work sponsor. Uh, and the project I work on for, Learn, for Illuminate is the Learn Central uh, social community, an educator network that is free for educators. So we encourage you to come and check it out. It does have Illuminate baked in, and you can use it for free. Coming up on conversations.net in the future of education, actually right now is my PBS show on copyright criminals. There was a, an overlap in the schedules, but that's being recorded as well. So if you're here, we'll hope you'll stick around and watch that later. Tomorrow, Sharon Peters talks about education beyond borders. They've actually changed the name of that organization, but Sharon does work in Africa with students and technology. Starting on March 16th, a series on open source software for school technology leadership teams. On the 16th, another PBS show, Women of Science. On the 17th, we kick off Education for Digital World 2.0, a new series based on a book, and we'll have about 20 sessions, uh, sort of in the trenches sessions on the use of Web 2.0 in education. March 17th, 21st Century Skills. March 18th, A View from the Commercial Side of EdTech. March 23rd, Kathy Davidson. March 24th, Bill Kist on the Socially Network Classroom. David Hill on the 25th, Sir Ken Robinson on the 30th. Lots more fun. Tony Wagner on the Global Achievement Gap on April 6th. Scott Rosenberg and, and more fun things coming. Tim Magner has confirmed that it would be fun to have Tim on. Uh, Tim. If you've missed the session and you want to go back, all of the recordings are there in, in good form, I think, based on tonight's uh, topic, uh, including Clay Shirky, Dan Pink, James Paul G., Tara Hunt, Dan Coyle. Lots of fun sessions to go back and look at if you're interested at all at conversations.net or futureofeducation.com. If this is your first time in Illuminate, we want to make sure that you know how to participate. This is a participative environment. At the bottom of the participant window, there are some emoticons that you can use, a smiley face, a clapping hand, a confused look, or a thumbs down. If you would like to ask a question, and with the group this side, that would be just fine tonight. There is a hand with a green up arrow, and you click on that, and that's raising your hand, and we'll give you the microphone. If you think you might want to do that, go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure that your microphone is working. OK, here's a map of the world. I'm going to questions. And look for the wand with the little red star to the left of the map. Click on that, and then click on the map and let us know where you're listening from. You can also shout it out in the chat. Looks like we have Mexico. Massachusetts, Aguas Calientes for Benjamin, wherever you're listening from or if you're listening to the recording, we are glad to have you with us tonight. Okay, so our topic tonight is a book called Total Recall. And uh, uh, I'm going to do, I'm just going to briefly introduce this book and then let uh, Gordon and Jim tell you a little bit about it by saying that I literally felt like I swallowed this book whole. I made so many notes about things that were of interest to me that I had been thinking about. Uh, and I think, I think this is going to end up being kind of a seminal work. Uh, Gordon and Jim, you talk about science fiction in the book. The book is, is, is as compelling as science fiction for me, but it was completely, I had this sense of this is inevitable. This is going to happen. So will you tell us a little bit about how the book came about and the ideas, and then go as far as you want before you pass it back to me, and I'll throw some questions at you. Well, why don't I give a, a little uh, background to the book, and then Gordon can tell you a little bit of the history of us starting. But the, the basic concept of the book is that we're coming to the ability to ha have a complete recording of our lives, where you could have everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever seen, everything you ever read in your life, and much more from 
like what is the current temperature and humidity, all kinds of sense values. And this is going to be possible in the next 10 years based on things that we already see demonstrated in research labs. And this is going to have an incredible impact on uh, society as we be, uh, begin to take advantage of that. And maybe Gordon can say a few words about how we got started. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, actually, we started uh, uh, a little over 10 years ago when uh, uh, the idea of recording, uh, uh, putting books online. A friend of mine asked to scan some of my books as a test, and then I started scanning my stuff. And so the the first period up until 2000 was to, or about 2001 was to see just how you would go about putting your life online, and then. Jim joined in 2001, and from then until 2005, the purpose was to basically, instead of putting things into the into the system, it was to try to decide how we got them out of the system. So it was search, it was organization, it was examining and using a database to hold everything. And uh, then when we started the book, why it turns out that we feel like the uh, the, let's call it the killer app, may be having a surrogate memory or having an e-memory. So it really went through three stages of, uh, of development. So it seems to me that part of the message of the book that we'll get into is that because of these capabilities, we're going to have to figure some things out. You know, not only are, we, are there technical issues, but it feels like there are social and cultural issues as well. So Gordon, you've done a fair amount of this for yourself in a in a in something you call life logging, which I think is the MyBits program, right? Do you want to describe that briefly? Well, I want to say life logging is is the notion that you that you're you are trying to log virtually everything you can about your life, and um, but that. That really has to do with, you know, capturing your emails, capturing everything that goes through your um, through the computer. And I think Jim is going to um, talk about sort of exactly what we capture. But life logging is is really the capture and the collection or the logging of, of personal information for personal use. And we make a strong distinction between life logging and blogging. The information we have in our hard drives is really for our own, our own memory and our own own consumption, and it's really not uh, uh, not a public uh, forum for uh, putting our life online. So it's it's not blogging; it's logging. Yeah, and in terms of of what it meant for us to do that logging uh, initially. It, it was an exercise in, in digitization of making things digital that hadn't been in the past. So Gordon had enormous amounts of paper to be scanned and old printed photos to, to scan also and uh, movies to convert and so on. So there was that whole effort, which was a lot of work. But also, as I became involved, we said, hey, what can we, uh, what going forward, how can we capture your life better? What things can we do to make it more automatic? And so besides, of course, having digital photos and keeping email, we wrote tools, for example, to record every web page that we visited and to collect all our computer uh, chat sessions and to record what we were doing on our computers. Uh, and even in Gordon's office, we set up a system to record his telephone calls. Right. So uh, those who haven't read the book, and I'm, I'm going to guess that may be most here, um, this process of going through and recording everything, uh, Gordon, how did that feel? Well, I think you know after we start doing it, it was it uh, it feels totally natural, and in fact, not recording things is not a, is now to me feels non natural. Um, but in fact, for, to start with, a lot of what a lot of people's Let's call it formal communication or communication really is already going through your computer or or your cell phone. So all of your messages are uh, whether they're SMS messages or email, those messages are there are are being captured. And so 
we automatically want to capture all of all of those things. In addition, we you know we certainly capture all the documents that we write. Uh, all and by the way, one of the things that has stimulated the, the use of this or uh, made it made it obvious and easy is the fact that uh, all of the all of the photos now virtually all photographs come in are coming in digitally. So all new stuff is coming in digitally. Now in the past what you all of the shoeboxes full of photos you're going to have to go back and take them to the drugstore or wherever and have them scanned or you're going to have to get a scanner and make a make uh, make those available to the computer. But in general um, most of life now <laughs> Goes through, uh, comes in through our, our computer as a as a as a communications device. So, isn't there a pretty large degree to which our culture and institutions are based on the fact that our memories are fallible? That that a lot of what we do, a lot of the the patterns are are based on our inability to remember lots of things. And so, what will the preservation of accurate historical events? All the time, what's that likely to? What where areas of culture are those likely to change? Yeah, you know, it's really analogous to the advent of literacy. If you think about what we call prehistory, uh, being before there was any record left, uh, you know, the things were just handed down orally, and the advent of literacy, the idea that well, you know, we can't just rely on human memory and, and oral traditions, let's write some things down to keep track of stuff, had a big impact. And by the way, uh, as it came about, we have Plato uh, worrying that it might be a really bad thing for, for our brains for us to be able to write things down. But the, you see there's this big change that, okay, it's probably driven by things like accounting records to begin with, where you don't want to just rely on your brain to keep track of uh, what the business deal is and how many were bought and sold and so on. Uh, we've right down the line to scientific in endeavor, enjoyed the benefits of having these accurate records, and now that's going to multiply into our personal lives and our health. It's going to make us healthier and more productive. So I'm thinking of how the instant replay changed um, refereeing and football. So maybe that would be sort of the positive. And then on the other side, I'm thinking of how the volume of instant data from the stock market almost leads us to do things that are not sensible because we don't seem to have an ability to think long term when faced with that much information. So are, are there ways in which we, with all of this information we're going to have to recognize that our brains don't work well with a lot of information and figure out ways to sort it that it does make sense? Well, one, one thing that's going on here is once you once you have uh, an electronic memory, the thing the thing we call, we would constantly refer to as the e-memory in in the system is that you you suddenly feel very free that you don't have to remember all of those those kind of events and that you can go back and look at at them and gain a perspective by the fact that there is a history that you can. Can recall, or in the other, in, in other cases, if you want to look at, uh, you know, all of the numbers that are coming in uh, from the stock market or whatever, why well, you can at least have have a computer there to help you go and start and uh, and and pour over them and do the analysis. So I I think I think overall, it uh, the main benefit is is that. Uh, a uh, freedom of not having to remember that, but yet having having the certainty that it, in fact, it is all there. If you want to, uh, if you want to avail yourself of it, uh, one of the earliest things that we did started capturing was web pages, uh, not just the URLs or the pointers to to where those pages are, but the full page, so that you know, you may, two or three days later, when you say, "Gee, I think I'd like to go back and look at that." House or that sweater or this or that, you can actually go back and find it and not have to go go through the whole search process you did 
when you uh, initially created the uh, when when you initially found the web page uh, uh, an, at an earlier time. So I can remember visiting with a photographer, a sports photographer who was quite good, and and I was interested in photography at the time. And he said to me, "You have to throw away 95% of what you do, otherwise." You'll think you're better than you are, and you won't be focused on what's really important. How do you determine, with all of the data, what to actually look back on? And and do you even ha do you have a time issue in terms of having even the time to look back? Yeah, you know that's that's a great point for us to make this distinction between the differences between. The electronic world, having electronic memories, and having our biological memories, and having our stacks of stuff, and in our own minds and in our stacks of physical stuff, we suffer from being overwhelmed in all this clutter. And the wonderful thing is to be able to have a machine sort that out for you and say, "Hey, you know what? I'm, you know, when you first go to look at uh, the whole pile of photos." I'm just going to show you the good ones, and the other ones are just kind of there if you need them. Or uh, I'm going to take all your web pages that we viewed, and we actually did this for Gordon's system. We said we're going to find all the ones that are nearly duplicates, and let's stash them away so they're not in your face, and help you just look at the ones that are unique. And so, actually, while our brains get overloaded with clutter, and our you know our our offices get overloaded with clutter, the machine is wonderful at having the ability of software to get rid of clutter. I'm interested in sort of an intriguing potential difference in how we think when we store information that way. So for me, I'm a computer nut. I'm looking at actually three screens here. I, I do everything in Google Docs because I can instantly access it and love it. But I also carry a leather notebook because some of the things that I want to write about and, and think about actually somehow process better for me when I'm writing them. Do you, have you noticed that there, that we do think differently, and and are these changes that we are going to become aware of and choose when to uh, store electronically and when to not? No, not in terms of when to store, because what you're really talking about there is the input-output experience that you want that writing experience. You're still better served by storing that digitally, and and by the way, the tablet makers will. Uh, continue refining what they're doing until you're happy uh, doing your drawing there too. Um, you have to make the distinction between your nice I/O experience that maybe you like it displayed on paper, maybe you like writing on paper, compared with the storage. I, I just made a chat to someone on the side who was talking about losing uh, losing things on the computer. I said, "Well, yeah, but I've lost papers, and you know, try backing up your paper. You, uh, no hope there." Well, I don't. Well, and also on the paper, the issue is. Is if you on paper the biggest problem uh, when you have a lot of it uh, is misfiling uh, and or even just being able to find find stuff in the pack. If you look at uh, the system I have now, uh, uh, I've I've got somewhere in the range of uh, of a half a million uh, pages of of text or or probably more. I haven't haven't counted them recently, but uh, that's all the papers. It's got all it's stacks and stacks of magazines that are in there, uh, jur journals. Uh, there are 300 books, and all of that all of that really is just kind uh, zero clutter. I mean, those are it. I yet I can I know I can find uh, or the computer can find uh, some a reference to any of that material almost instantaneously. So it's really. I think in your case on the notebook, there's something, there's something a little, you know, where you're using that kind of as a sketch, kind of a uh, a thought pad or what have you. But um, uh, but I I think I agree with Jim that I think a tap, you know, people who are thinking that uh, people who want the kind of tablet that kind of experience, the tablet turns out to be. A pretty good experience. Uh, we also had the there's a company called Evernote, and then Microsoft's OneNote are are similar kinds of things, so that they're very good at at sort of sketching, allowing you to sketch, and allowing you to 
uh, extent. For example, uh, OneNote has the ability to to arbitrarily extend a piece of the size of a paper, so that if you run out of a you know you're writing along and you want to add another line in the middle, uh, you can do that and uh, not 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 be uh, doing it like you do with a, a sort of formal formatted uh, uh, word document. I don't want you to feel like we're putting you in the position of defending this vision because I don't feel that way. I feel that what you've described has some inevitability to it, okay. All right. and I'm just kind of curious about sort of what the cultural negotiations that we'll go through both individually and society will be. And I love that you kind of brought out the movie and science fiction piece because it seems like that is a way in which we do culturally negotiate, where we sort of figure things out. Actually, let me just say a word about the inevitability, Steve. The, the reason we say this is inevitable is, uh, first of all, because there's these three streams of technology driving this. That the, the digital storage is becoming cheaper and cheaper and more plentiful. We're getting more and more recording devices and sensors that are becoming near zero cost and easy to deploy everywhere. So we can record, we can store it, and then software is coming along to make use of all this where we can do data mining, we can hide clutter, we can discover trends, we can visualize, we can package things up and attract stories for storytelling. So that, that's the potent three streams that are driving this. And then we say it's inevitable because it's not just speculation. Virtually everything we talk about we've already seen demonstrated in research labs. It's just a matter of productizing it. So uh, uh, one day I was in Walmart. I was traveling. I went into the local Walmart. Walmart sort of a touchstone for me when I'm traveling. It will always be the same. And in the $5 video bin was uh, the movie Final Cut with Robin Williams. And, and I may be one of the few people who actually watched that movie besides you guys. And I really loved the idea that there was this inherent question in there of how does life change when everything gets recorded. Is, is that a movie that you've both sort of, have you, have, have you had a chance to use it besides the book and talking about these ideas? Yeah, I mean, that movie and also there's a, a number of other uh, sci-fi books that really get into the issue of what, what if there's more and more recording or uh, I recently read a sci-fi book by Arthur Clarke on, uh, you know, considering, well, what if we could even go back in time and get a true record of everything? Which is really, that's the societal implication that people grapple with the most is what if you can't escape the truth? What if the truth is knowable? Um, in, in the extreme, that's what uh, people want to worry about. I was sorry not to see the movie. Go ahead. By the way, there's oh, there's a there's a new series out, which is the prequel apparently to uh, Battleship uh, Galactica. I think it's called Captain Caprica. I was gonna Caprica. I was gonna bring it up anyway. <laughs> guess what? The first. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we can. Do you want to hold it? I. But anyway. The first episode, to me, come almost the script came. One of the the heroine's first statement, or one of her early statements, uh, uh, is the use of my life bits to capture all of her life and put it into an avatar. So the the scene starts with the creation of of this. Uh, a uh, young lady creating her own avatar based on all of her my life bits. So it really is, you know, we're there. Uh, and uh, I've got to say that I'm, uh, I personally am trying to do uh, to make an avatar that uh, that will at least answer various questions about me. You know, it, I won't say it, I won't say even think that it's conversing, but it certainly knows a lot about me that uh, you can communicate with. Well, on the premise of that particular... So, anyway, these are... There's a slight lag in the audio, no. which is why you Go ahead. Over. I'm talking over you. So the premise of that particular character in the, in the series is that they're actually able to, to some degree, replicate her personality through all of the data that was collected about her. And you know that's kind of grown on me over time since I saw that first episode. And actually, reading the book, you know, really solidified this sense that okay, if you could capture everything that took place in someone's life and all of their talk and mannerisms, could you actually create 
um, a, a duplicate that would uh, in many ways mimic or resemble the original person. And I thought, this is, this, this will, it first seemed really far out there to me and then looked a little bit more realistic after reading the book. Yeah, well, you think of the material that mimics use right now, you know, the people who are good at maybe mimicking a president or something like that, and they have the little, uh, the little wording, and they know the, they know the spiels that they tend to do and the mannerisms and everything else. Uh, this, is, this is that on steroids. I mean, it's like giving a really good mimic uh, a million times the source material to work from. Well, the other movie I thought of that you didn't mention was Defending Your Life. Are you familiar with that movie? So no. it's um, uh, Albert Albert Brooks no, and Meryl Streep, and uh, this guy. They go to heaven, and in heaven they actually show you little bits of your life that have been fully recorded to determine if you advanced enough in your life existence. And you're going to love it. <laughs> I mean, it's just so right there for you. That, that's great. Hey, you know, one thing I would just like to say. I, I think it's totally appropriate that we grapple with these ultimate implications and the sci-fi kind of angle to what the end piece is. But it's important that people understand the context of, you know, we're saying this is inevitably coming and is grow it's a growing trend over the next 10 years built on not this sort of recording of video and audio of your life, but people recording more and more health data, having wearable devices and in-home devices and even eventually in-body devices, they're going to record more and more of their health. People going on vacations and wanting to do you know, terrific travelogues and great family photos and passing on heirlooms in that sense, we're going to see an increase in, in storytelling and photo taking and so on. So there's going to be a very organic kind of growth, a very positive, non-threatening things here. And Ironically, someone was just asking me about this today, about the, the things we grapple with and the scary parts. And I said, well, the funny thing is, the scary stuff is already here. You know, people are already releasing, like, the Michael Phelps incident and embarrassing him and so on. The, the scary aspects of recording we already live with, what we're about to come into is some of the really exciting beneficial aspects. Well, so let's talk, uh, if we can, about some of the concerns because um, as there was a story, Gordon, you tell in the book about taking a picture, I think it was at a blanket, I can't remember, but where that was sufficient for you to pass that on to your son but to have the photograph. And we've done that with our kids' uh, soccer trophies, of which there are, you get way too many anyway. But then I was worried about you know, aren't there, don't we have some concern that if we digitize everything, that, that somehow that can get lost? I mean, uh, are, is it realistic to think that there are weapons of a sort that would actually destroy all electronic data? Um, well, I think, I think, yeah, in the same way that there's weapons that destroyed all, all physical data, you know, I mean, the atomic bomb does a pretty good job of that. Uh, and so I, you know, by the way, w one of the things that we do, do do have a concern about is the lo life, the long lifetime of digital data. But the the nice thing is there is so much concern about that that I believe that it's we're continuing to uh, uh, to solve to solve that. If you have if you have the data, I've looked at laboratories that have data that's you know 40 or 50 year old data. And uh, basically, they make the provisions for uh, updating that, uh, updating those formats, updating the storage media. And so, I think in a way, people are going to going to do that too. They'll probably boil a lot of it down, but but in in fact, they will end up with a lot of permanent uh, permanent uh, uh, items, um, and and they will want to. Uh, uh, preserve, you know, they wouldn't want to preserve that. Uh, we tell us also, I think we tell a story about, you know, uh, one of our colleagues who was looking at his, uh, uh, when his mother had passed away, of going in and seeing what he wanted, uh, you know, what kinds of artifacts that he wanted from that, that period. And, you know, initially, the first part of the day, he 
you know, he sort of filled up a box, and then as the day wore on, why basically the bo uh, the boxes were just uh, totally totally trashed, and so much of you know, uh, so much of the things that you think are going to get handed down, basic physically now, I think uh, they aren't handed down at all. They just they, they go. So I think, frankly, I think we've got a better chance of doing of, of passing things on electronically with multiple cop uh, with multiple copies to various you know to your children, grandchildren. We'll make we'll make lots of copies of our lives we, as long as they want them. So in terms of thinking of uh, but it isn't, you know, but it. Sorry, the delay again. Go ahead. India, I don't have anything to add. So, Sorry. in terms of a sort of other other pushback, uh, you know, one of the concerns that I would have is that we're going to be buried in minutia, and so are we going to have to develop ways to uh, even sort of categorize or rank things? Because I would worry that there's, with so much, even in my own life right now, there's so much that that I find that it's just overwhelming. Well, you know, that's that's exactly one of the three streams of technology here is the software to manage and to deal with that. So that, you know, for instance, one thing we say is, look, it's got to be automatic. If we're talking about a whole bunch of work, it's a non-starter. And uh, you know, Gordon can elaborate on how. We've always been driven by it's got to be useful to us. We, we we had one guy say, "Oh no, you'll be obsessing over your life all the time." We said, "No, you probably obsess over your life more than we do over ours." The point is, is that it's useful. Now, the machine can do things like, for instance, let's say you take uh, with a sense cam. We wear these sense cams that have uh, sensors on them, you know, infrared sensors to detect when there's a person there and take a picture, and light level sensors to tell when there's a scene change and take a picture, and accelerometers to tell. If it's jiggling around, so it might be a blurry picture, so it'll wait. You can get 3,000 photos a day out of these, and you'd say, "Oh my goodness, I'll just be so cluttered, I can't stand it." But then our our wonderful colleagues at Dublin City University, they did software that looked at all the different sensor parameters, and they also look for faces and clothing patches, and they say, "Hey, let's look for novelty in your life. Are you seeing? Are you in the same old place with the same movement pattern, seeing the same old faces? Boring." Let's look for new faces, new places, interesting things, and they automatically do a visual diary of your day and enlarge the things that are interesting and novel and hide the other things. So that's where the software really wins. What is it about thinking about the future that's so much fun? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, fun. I guess it's fun for us. I don't know whether people does everybody think it's fun. I mean, the uncertainty, uh, or do they just think it's uncertain? Uh, in our case, I think we look at it and uh, kind of we see. I mean, as you mentioned, these various problems, like the one of preserving stuff forever, that we spend our life, our time thinking about. Okay, how are we going to have? Uh, how are we going to be able to store stuff that is going to be able to live forever? Or, for example, the problem you just discussed, which is we've got too much stuff, and how do you how do you write software that makes that that automatically makes that uh, uh, the call and makes that interesting, or automatically organizes things? Uh, for example, I have uh, at one point we were looking at automatically recognizing a whole bunch of Different documents. There, at one point, we we looked, and I think I had about 200 different document, or let's call them not documents, but item types. Things like grade cards, greeting cards, business cards, uh, wills, codicils, uh, uh, trusts, uh, you know, transactions, uh, 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 books, uh, records, and so on, and so. Uh, what we want is to be able to have uh, have the system automatically be able to understand it the way we want it to, we want it understood, so that we can can have the can have it automatically re, uh, called up and organized. Uh, and we have so much faith that that's that that's going to be d done. So I think the fun to me is the sort of gradual unraveling of the technology. 
or the not the unraveling or the disclosing of the technology that will make all of this uh, much more automatically. For example, speech to text. The minute we've got really reliable uh, speech recognition, then then we're going to I'm going to be regretting that I don't haven't captured all of the conversations uh, that I've ever had, so that in fact those can be all recalled. And I thought, yeah. And if I can chime in too on on the the uh, just why is it fun? I think the thing is Gordon and I are both insatiably curious, and you have to understand we didn't start out with a, a big vision of the future and then set out to build this stuff. It started with a simple – we looked ahead and we said, hey, we're going to have terabyte hard drives. And those are going to be hard to fill up. And what would that be like? And just out of curiosity, we started collecting all this stuff. We didn't start out knowing that you know, we thought it was a good idea or what the – we were just curious. What would that be like? Let's try it. And as we tried it, we discovered these things. And that's just really fun. Okay, so uh, Deb was asking about the sense cam. And I did a quick search. A Microsoft site comes up, but it says you don't have permission to access it. Can you actually buy a sense cam? Um, so you should be able to get to SenseCam on the Microsoft Research site. I, I guess you're not just kidding the page. I think there might be even a Wikipedia page. Uh, it's recently been um, licensed, and you, there's an entry in our blog at our TotalRecallBook.com about the licensing of it. So theoretically, yes, you can purchase it. I, you'd have to contact the company licensing it, though. I believe that their target market right now is for um, the health setting, there's a number of hospitals who are very excited about applying this technology to memory loss patients. And early studies were extremely promising to where people who under their old regimen could only remember things for a couple of weeks were being able to retain things for several months. And so I think all of the sense can production right now is going to that market, but uh, maybe they'll go broader too, I don't Somebody's know. Somebody's... Let me add, hey, uh, let me add one thing to... Uh, which is that today, uh, uh, the New York Times had a wonderful article on the use of the SenseCam for people with memory impairments. It was done. The SenseCam was that work was done by Carnegie Mellon, and they actually they had the SenseCam plus an audio recorder and a GPS camera, and they were they were able to show how uh, patients with uh, basically. Uh, Alzheimer's that we never thought could be able to use this uh, are in fact uh, occasionally being able to uh, remember things. So, so look look on the New York Times today for SenseCam, but also go and uh, just look at Wik Wikipedia. The SenseCam and uh, on Wikipedia is a, a so good. So I think I found it. it says for the afflicted, a little black box to jog failing memory. That's well, it. So I'm, I, I don't know if I missed this in the book or if you didn't mention it, but it occurred to me that facial recognition for photographs will dramatically change our accessing of photographs. Yeah, there's, there's no question. That's absolutely true. And actually, the state of state of the art of facial recognition is starting to get pretty good. Where for head-on, well-lit photos. Uh, they expect to, to pretty much nail them. And some of the other poorly lit kind of added angle shots that they're they're still working on these days. Well, I it's uh, there are products, <laughs> there are nice products out there that actually uh, do face recognition uh, uh, to to a large extent that are in a totally practical way. So uh, uh, you know I. I must point out that Microsoft Research had one about five years ago, and it still is not a product, which is to me is an embarrassment from our standpoint. But in fact, uh, face recognition uh, for most people, uh, for for most families, I think uh, you know does exist pretty well today. So Teresa is asking if she wanted to make sure that. And I'm not go ahead. Take... I'm just going to quickly let those in the audience know was... that was Gordon All speaking. Right. Slightly deeper voice, and and Jim, say something now so people know it's you. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is Jim. So that's Jim, and the other was Gordon. So um, I loved the mirror, the picture-taking mirror. 
I got to believe that's coming soon, or that some smart camera manufacturer will, you know, sort of figure out a way to, to create a device that will do that. Are there other really fun things you're seeing where you say, and I know you mentioned some in the book, but maybe call them out here, where you're saying, okay, this is this is going to happen in the next couple of years, and it will be really fun when it does. Well, we've already we've already gotten response from a couple of people who are already making. Uh, some of the products, uh, so uh, I think particularly the one, uh, the Swiss Data Bank. We've already had, we're already interacting with a, uh, a couple of places where where that's going, and which is which is, in a way kind of addresses this problem of uh, of uh, longevity for data. When you also mentioned the wearable you health know, devices. I was Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's lots of wearable health devices coming out all the time. And I was just looking over our blog and the number of things we've been mentioning coming out just since we released the book. I mean, we're almost worried that the book is going to come to market too late. Things are happening so fast. So here's just a few things that are out there. So, of course, you know, with Microsoft has Health Salt and there's Google Health for storing data. There's a several other companies in that line now. Uh, the new the new iPod Nano that came out supporting not only video recording but a pedometer. So and I was looking at the screen where they they're estimating your calories in the iPod Nano. Um, announcements that uh, San Jose police are going to be wearing head mounted cameras. Uh, Samsung releasing a camera with GPS uh, location ability. A whole bunch of services to back up all your information from your cell phone so you don't lose your text messaging and so on. I mean, uh, the lifebio.com to help you tell stories. Uh, Earth class mail to automatically scan your postal mail and turn it into electronic form. I mean, things are just going wild out there. So what about the privacy issue? Because clearly, uh, Gordon, you talk about your life logging and you're not life blogging, and you're keep, you're deciding when you're going to release that material. You're keeping track of it, but you're not necessarily releasing it now. But a large amount of data is out there, and it's growing every day. Are there sort of immediate places to be concerned? Ooh, uh, you know, I guess in in a way, what we advocate is probably not not putting any more data out there that's uh, intentional data than uh, than you want discovered. So, uh, you know, I uh, I was in a in a meeting the other day, and somebody said, "Gee, there there really are like 90 places where where uh, you can go and find out a lot of different information about 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 your about an individual by yourself." So that uh, some of it, some of it being public, uh, uh, I think that's not a. Cons I don't think those are. A con we didn't deal with that concern for my life bits because we weren't adding. To, we were not adding to the problem. We, you know, in terms of what we what we were doing uh, was not was not intentionally going out and creating a larger cross section for people to go out and find out more about about an individual. Um, you mean for but we certainly are I think we are concerned about So I'm not hearing either of you speak, but uh, I, I guess from my standpoint, I'm thinking of some of the you know, potentially really incredibly valuable information that could be gleaned from the kind of crowdsourcing of large quantities of information versus the the potential loss of privacy if we're not careful about uh, keeping some of that sacred. Well, that's right. Actually, one of the most exciting things is, again, preserving privacy. So if you think now someone wants to do a health kind of study, and they want to get even a thousand participants. It's very expensive. And by the way, they have to go through a lot of work to do with privacy also. So it's very expensive, very difficult to do. And so we only get these studies at a certain pace. Imagine instead that we had the computer anonymize the data, we could have results from a million people cheaply and easily and preserve the anonymity. I mean, we actually have in our uh, Microsoft Research Lab here at Silicon Valley, we have people who specialize in this. 
who have an excellent, just excellent mathematical background to what do you have to do to obscure the data enough so it's absolutely untraceable, even when you, uh, you know, revealing certain values. Uh, so that's a very exciting area. Well, so yeah, I mean that's a that's one of these wonderful double-edged swords that that you buy. Uh, there's a, a site that's called Patients Like Me, where a group of for a large group of patients will in fact uh, share data about a particular kind of malady or disease, and by just by having all that data together, uh, you get enormous amount of of insight uh, from that. But the cost is uh, is uh, is a little bit of uh, giving up of some giving up of your some of your data and some privacy. Well, so I have a couple of health issues. I got, I'm sorry. I have, so I have vitiligo, the skin uh, pigment disorder Michael Jackson had, and I have an autoimmune blood clotting disorder. And I you know I worry that were some of this information or, or any new findings that come out that it would impact my ability to get insurance. Is that something people worry about? Well, people, people do worry about that, absolutely. And But of course, I think what you're going to see is, again, it's a double-edged sword. And the insurance companies are going to have to look at the trade-off of, clearly, people are not going to reveal such data if it's going to possibly lead to losing their insurance. And on the other side of the upside, where data like this is collected, there's studies that show people take their medications better. Uh, there's, of course, there's more better understanding, early treatments of things, and so on. So the insurance company tends to save a ton of money by encouraging people to do this. And so, if the cost to them to to do that is to assure people, hey, we'll give you a guarantee that you know you won't lose coverage, um, it's in their interest to do it. Yeah, that one still makes me nervous. My insurance company assuring me. <laughs> Why would that concern me? They're, no, they're going to look. If if some of that's disclosed, the current situation, you know, and I bet I'm going to have to preface it, uh, and I don't want to make this political, but uh, you know, I do live in San Francisco. Uh, but but uh, in fact, the, the sure as hell, the insurance company is going to cut you off if they find those things out, and. Uh, that's why I hope there's some changes, uh, changes to the so that those things can be dealt with. You know whether whether it's that that everybody is now in a, you know in a in a different category or you you know we're in different contained risk schools or whatever. But uh, I'll let, I actually let let me I want to jump in here before you you turn this into just Gordon and I are arguing right. politics because we actually have very different views on it. But what what we do share is, I, I want you to think about this, is what we're talking about again is collecting health data that you, you don't have to give it to your, uh, you know, your insurance company. You have to give it to your physician if you don't want to. I mean, there's immense benefit of if you have, say, a heart condition uh, like Gordon does, of tracking and seeing the data for yourself. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see you know, key indicators starting to go up or down or whatever it is. This is going to be a big win. Yeah. By the way, and and to a large extent, uh, forget the privacy stuff right now. You, uh, if the insurance company is really on the ball, they're going to go out and find out what you're buying, what drugs you're buying at the drugstore, and they're going to get a record of your purchases, and they're going to know know from what you buy at the drugstore that what you got. Boy, this is so in. You can find out all uh, just just so interesting. Now I'd rather my computer to know what I do. Okay, so I um I'm gonna have to leave in a couple of minutes and and I think that this is this has been a really fascinating discussion. I want to kind of finish for me on uh some of the uh, surprisingly sort of emotional memories of the book. Uh, it was the story of the guy who saw the picture of his wife before you know looked back before he knew she was going to become his wife. Uh, you know the ideas of of how things change when we know something about our ancestors that we didn't know. See an ancestor with a physical resemblance to ourselves. It felt to me like in the midst of all of the complicated discussions here that there was something a little bit magical 
do, do either of you feel that, or is that something you tend to express? Yeah, I absolutely feel that. I recently um, got a digital copy of my grandfather uh, speaking, a recording of him, and he, he had a Scotch accent, and uh, it was very touching to me. And I thought, wow, it is so meaningful to, to get these glimpses and get this little feeling, well, what were my ancestors like? I, and there's all kinds of moments like that that we mentioned in the book. Yeah, I have a similar... So yeah. Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, I... I I think I think it the the book and also having the bits in in the my life bits together all of that cert and then Jim's story certainly changed my view about the value of uh of home movies or uh of audio recording in general. I I'm now a very strong advocate of anything that's going to get capture a lot of the presence of individuals. Uh, whether it's you know uh, you know I've got I have lectures uh, that go back you know 30 or 40 years black and white uh, videos you know some of which are very embarrassing but but um, I my regret is I have no no audio recordings of my parents nothing uh, nothing and I had I would have had stuff around but but I simply don't have any and I think those are the kinds of things that uh, we probably should have warned people immediately. Go out and capture some some audio right now, because uh, you you know any still camera, all the current digital cameras do that. So that's great advice. So Teresa, can I ask you a favor? Can you <laughs> sail the ship into the harbor? I have another event I have to run to. I'm going to clap right sure. now for both Gordon and Jim, and just thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts on this book. This is a book I'm highly recommending. I'm really glad that I read it myself, and I really appreciate the time that both of you have put into not only the work, but in, in actually writing the book. And I'm going to take us to the final slide, which just shows the upcoming uh, sessions. First, the thanks to Illuminate and to C. Bloom and Associates. C. Bloom sponsors my book purchases, so they relieve me of that stress. So thank you, Charlene and company. Here's the final list. Gordon, Jim, uh, I'll let uh, Teresa take over from this part, but thanks so much for a really fun evening. Great talking thanks to you, Thanks, you Steve. too. Hey, thanks a lot, Steve. It's, we've thanks, Gordon. So I'll go ahead and pick up, and I'm actually just going to pick up on the last comment you were just talking about, Gordon. I think I, I mentioned you guys, you gentlemen over Christmas. Um, I was emailing with you guys, and I literally, um, I videoed, my my family Christmas, as per your comments, and we actually my father gave a gift to all of our young nieces and nephews of the family, and my parents actually recorded from Hallmark um, the Christmas story, and both of them read the story to the kids. But it's actually an audio recording, so the kids can actually read the story and hear my mom and dad with the story. It's amazing. You know, it's so wonderful. My uh, my my uncle just passed away last year, and uh, his son, a couple of years beforehand, had had the foresight to sit down with him and do an audio interview with him, and he ended up sharing that on a CD with all the family members. And you know, we love telling stories about our uncle, but hearing him tell the stories in his own voice, and now that he's passed away, I just can't tell you how special that was. You know, I can I can also relate. It's it's ironic today. I mean, I've read this book, and I can't tell you how many times reading the book I thought about those kind of um, moments. And it's ironic today is the the 15th anniversary of the day my my younger brother died from cancer. And you know, we've got 14, you know, we're on 15 nieces and nephews now, and we have tons and tons of pictures and lots and lots of stories. And you know, we don't have anything really of audio and video. So I'm I'm all about it. And I think everybody thinks I'm a little obsessive about it, but I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, make sure you make copies of that. Put them on put them on several computers. Exactly. Yeah, the, it's a backup. It's a backup. You know what's interesting too is, you know, as we're in this time, just as Total Recall is getting started, and and maybe we don't have these 
uh, digital artifacts or any artifacts at all of people. And it's interesting that there's even these life memorial sites starting up where people can come and tell their stories about the person uh, who's passed away. And then at least those stories are collected and preserved. Mm -hmm. I think that's really a, a cool uh, attack at, at the lack of records that we have today. Yeah. And um, I actually just wanted to get back to um, some of the points. I know there were a couple of questions in, um, in the chat. Um, if I can just grab two of them real quick. Um, I know David had asked this, and I think you mentioned it in the book, Gordon, but how many gigs and how much space did you actually use to get all of your, your life bits? Okay, right now there's about uh, 250 uh, gigabytes. So it's not a lot. So it's kind of what you get in a, uh, in a large portable or a small desk size uh, computer. But I'd say um, a lot of that, a lot of that's video that I had had captured. But I, I think, you know, it's hard to say what averages will be. But I think, uh, I think people's, you know, will be surprised how little, how little it takes and how how much they can uh, uh, can uh, can store. The the big use, uh, the big uh, space uh, consumer is video. And so, uh, on the other hand, it's very important to to preserve that video. So it may extra, you may want an extra hard drive to just to do that. And of course, you want an extra hard drive just to back that other back it up. So it's going to be around forever. And I guess that kind of actually touches on Ben's question: was um, how do you keep all this amount of data up to date? And obviously, there's a shelf life of the content. And I think that answers it as well. But if you want to touch on that. Gordon, you want to try it? You want to do it, Jim? <laughs> We're both handing that off. Okay. Well, the um, there's a there's a couple of elements to shelf life. So one is uh, just keeping the bits safe. So you wouldn't want to not have it backed up. Uh, and it's very encouraging to me that these days that there's more and more. I you know I hear on radio and television advertisements for backup services now. I think that's terrific. People are coming to realize they want to keep their you know, family photos for the rest of their life at least. And uh, so that's one piece. The other thing is that the formats that we use can go stale. And so you may find out that, oh, you, if you save something in the, uh, you know, Super Photo Edit version 3.9 and all of a sudden that, that company goes out of business, you can't open the file anymore. Uh, for that reason, we try and use what we call golden file formats. We try and, you know, things that we think will have longevity. And my rule of thumb is I want at least 10 million people to be using it, or even 100 million, so that I believe there will always be a market to try and keep the files readable. Um, but I think ultimately this is an opportunity for a business that, uh, just like people offer these backup businesses, uh, that will be part of your backup is, well, we'll also roll your files forward to the next current uh, format to make sure they're always usable. So you're in, a, you're in a good place if you have a filing business and now you're going electronical. <laughs> You're safe. <laughs> so I think I think we're kind of yeah, sorry, okay. I missed that. It kind of okay, broke I think we're we're actually at the end here, and I know that you had to run off right at the end as well. So if there's any other questions or if there's any more comments that you guys wanted to make. Yeah, I just want to leave people with the context of we're not telling anyone they ought to do this or you know saying that um, you know you must. What, what we're saying is you will be able to. The technological capability is coming, and in so many different areas we discovered that there's enormous benefits. So we're just predicting. You just watch in the next ten years. There's going to be more and more and more of this stuff, and there's going to be you know a real impact on society as there is. I agree, and I think for me the biggest takeaway was, um, of course, those benefits of memory, the health, your work, and, and your everyday life. But for me, I'm already trying to figure out the way to make it useful. I've got all this information, and it's filing in a way. It's finding that structure, finding that hierarchy to make it useful. 
so I can go back and get into it. it seems to be my biggest challenge. Well, li well listen. Also, don't don't forget a lot of the software isn't shipped yet. So the other thing is just capture it. Uh, you want to have it so that when the program comes eight nine years from now, that automatically will sort it out for you. You've got the stuff. It, there'll be a lot of people who are going to be very sad. Who say, oh, I, you know, I didn't keep any of that stuff. I didn't capture any of that stuff, and then they're going to be out to lunch. I love it. Great. I feel like I'm on the game then. So thank you both very much for taking your time, and um, for everybody else that participated. I know a lot of people are going to download this. So thanks again to you both. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks, thank everybody you. else. Night. Bye bye.